Wabaset means in Native American Algonquin language, a place where the low tide is low enough that you can cross over. So right here was on the Nyasquatucket is where uh, Native people from all different directions would meet and cross over. And sometimes, you know, they would come in on a machine, which we, is a canoe, and uh, meet people. They do rendezvous, um, trade, lots of trade items, copper, um, wampum. Aoutash Wampanoag, Aoutash Narragansett, Aoutash Nipmuc, Aoutash Sequat. Way away, 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 away. Tatu Sipu. My name is Talking Water. That's how I say it in my Wampanoag language. My English name is Deborah Spears Moorhead. The Four Direction Sculpture that Allison Newsom and I will be proposing is about practicing equality, environmental stewardship, and cultural sustainability. I'm Allison Newsom, and I received my MFA at RISD and have been a resident of Rhode Island. Most recently, the last sort of decade, I've been working on rain harvesting sculptures that I call Rain Keep. The, the rain harvesting work I've been doing harvests rain with two uh, areas. There's sort of an upper canopy and a lower canopy. The upper canopy catches the rain and brings it down rain chains into the vessel. And then the secondary canopy, wings, petals, whatever the design, the site leads me to, brings in the water. So it's kind of a two-tiered collecting system. I actually have a, pat a utility patent on it, uh, design and utility, because of the way I'm harvesting with a three-dimensional object using rain chain and surface area in a way that nobody's done. So that's kind of exciting. <laughs> Deborah Spears Mordev is Eastern Woodlands Native American Wampanoag Narragansett um, artist, culture bearer. We collaborated really well together. The whole uh, sculpture will be about the protectors of the water, and it will also be about that everyone is equal. So it's going to be a rock, and the rock is going to have on it uh, four beings that represent the stages of life in the four directions. I'm known for terracotta faience, exterior ar architectural clay, and we'll be creating a timeline in this proposal in, in terracotta, working with John Stevenson. He's the founder and managing director of the Rhode Island Writers Colony for Writers of Color, and on the board of the Providence Antheneum, and he's going to work with me on the timeline. Our goal with the timeline is to take material culture, and what material culture is, they're the things of everyday life or peoples or touchstones of their life, pressed into wet clay into the timeline and then have uh, quotes that are germane to that following it. I'm a sculptor. I'm a in the trenches fine artist. You know, my work is collected in museums as fine art, and Deb's a fine artist. You know, as a painter, performance artist. For me, it's very important that the the real soul of this is born out of a fine artist sort of sensibility. Working with a, Deb and I both for decades, doing our our sculpture and our paintings, and and then it's very important to bring in the right architect to take that sculptural idea, that real fine art sensitivity, and they take it and really, really understand the public aspect of it, down to the seating and the lighting. And, you know, I have an, a wonderful engineer, Ron Gam, and I work with for my rain harvesting sculptures, because they require a lot of engineering. And he's working beautifully with my architects. It's just, it's just a perfect mesh of people. You've got your engineer, your architects, but at the heart of it, at the soul, are fine art, is fine art. I 
recently worked with this amazing architecture firm called Reed on a, a big rain harvesting sculpture in Soho, New York. The, the people who work for Reed are from all four corners of, of the planet and speak multi-language, multicultural group. And Ganush has been working closely with us. Ganush is from Istanbul and living in New York, working for Reed. And they have some uh, RISD graduate. Rebecca is working with us, and she's from um, South America. I love Addison's work. I've been able to experience it through a collaboration in New York City for an outdoor dining pavilion. The pieces she produces are real social catalyst. Of course, when she asked me if I wanted to participate in another piece in Providence, I was really excited to work with her again and see what's next, like what's the next level of those um, public interaction with her art and how we could help really uh, put it together. <laughs> The design has a lot of layers to it in what each element represents. This is a piece that aims to bring people together at a converging point that has been a point of intersection for thousands of years for different communities. So every choice in this design was made very intentionally, which includes every angle of every single object as well as their materials. We are looking at this design from the lens of a regular passerby children, tourists, and somebody who intentionally came to the site to learn. It's very important for us to be able to engage with every individual approaching this landmark through each and every element of the design. So my work for, for many years has all been about environmental issues and, and a lot about water. So I created these rain harvesting sculptures that they could stand three-dimensionally on their own and harvest rain. So that led to me then being asked to create uh, rain harvesting works that could be in public sites, you know, made out of materials that would uphold and, and, and couldn't be damaged by the public. We wanted the leaf canopy to function as a roof that would draw people in, whether they're just passing by or want to experience a place for longer. And at the same time, the intention was to have the design feel light and airy, which is why we ended up choosing steel mesh. For the, for the expansive lower canopy. Our work was to be really excited about the different elements that Addison, Deborah and John were bringing um, and also to try to bring a unifying element that would enable people to slow down, to take a little bit of a moment closer to those pieces so they can really understand them deeply. To do that, we created a canopy uh, through the rainwater harvesting utility that is spreading further away from the site, that is encompassing a bigger area than just where the art sits. A new scale for me, um, extending the canopy further than I have to collect rain. There are two different types of canopy. You have a solid canopy that really is here to capture the water bringing it to the medicinal garden uh, and is like a symbol of life. And it's also a lighter canopy that is made of mesh that is really just here to spread out and like enable a larger area where people can slowly approach the art, slow down and really start to feel that this space is special. I thought immediately, well, we can create a special garden that we water with a rain harvesting sculpture that acts for shelter from the sun, shelter from the rain, and a place to congregate. And actually harvests the rain for this medicine wheel garden, which is also for quadrants and about the colors, from the white to the red to the yellow to the deep colors. And I thought, this is perfect, because now we have sort of a theme for the garden and for the four directions. It was just, it, it was so natural and organic, considering it's actually being born out of a site that was so important to the Eastern Woodlands. It just, it was just every layer of it just happened so easily. 
So the idea would be the boulder. That's volume. Let's do this time immemorial boulder that is just so exquisite that you walk up to that's multifaceted, that reflects. And in some areas, it's pudding stone. And in some areas, it's reflecting all the people walking around and the colors from the medicine wheel garden. And let's do the, these beings that represent the north, south, east, and west that are very important to the um, Eastern Woodlands origin story, and even in terms of what they're wearing and what it symbolizes for the different directions. So this would be the, the, the flowers in the beds here, and they would come up over the cement foundation. Even the first year, we have some fast-growing perennials. Definitely by the second year, it would fill in, and it would look like it was sort of floating above this beautiful medicine wheel garden. So the tank is inside the boulder, the stainless steel boulder, and it's inside here. And it's very important to get the water all the way to the bottom, that our piece is up at least three feet, two and a half to three feet on the cement footing, so that the water, for gravity, we don't have to use a pump. You want everything lower than the lowest spot of the tank, so it's passive and doesn't require a pump. So all the water can flow easily through our drip irrigation system into all four beds. I also wanted to work with the river itself, collaborate with, with the water itself. Yeah, you got it cool, we get the right viscosity. Yeah. I like this lacy. What do you think? Can you do that? The idea is that the, the, the Moshasik and the uh, Wunusquatucket and their tributaries are actually partnering with us to actually create the art. The timeline that we're creating will have two levels. The base will be terracotta faience with artifact impressions taking you through the ages. The top will be reminiscent of sort of filigree and lacy shapes cast in bronze that we actually use the river, the Moshasik and the Wunusquatucket, to make the forms in the water of the two river, the two major tributaries of the Providence River. Those lacy forms will be mounted above the terracotta tableau, very airy, that you can see through to the river with writings on brass sheet, writings that are laser etched, woven into the river forms, and the writings will correspond below with the artifacts. Definitely, we, 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 in the timeline, we'll do some cowrie shells. There's manacles, there's a diagram of a slave ship, there's a cowrie shell. So these are the quintessential items that are part of the experience of African Americans. But what's nice with Keith Stokes and the Freedom Project, he has a great quote uh, from this project that says, slavery is not African American history or black history. It is a struggle that we overcame. The Rizzi alum and Harlem Renaissance sculptor, Nancy Elizabeth Prophet, has a quote that I've heard from artists and writers today, artists of color, who talk about being wholly oneself. And her quote is as follows, and I'll read it. Not to be wholly oneself is death to the soul. And that she said this in the 20s is, is very, very moving to me, and we're going to use that as well. So when I do a timeline, I like to take the clay and embed the objects, the artifacts, right in the clay. That are, some are recognizable, some aren't, and people love trying to figure it out. And all of this, there'll be an app, a QR code, to, if you want to know more about any of the writings or the artifacts. So I'm working on this clay to um, make the four figures that are going on the top of the rock. And uh, I will make the figures, design the figures, then they'll be scaled up to three feet. 
and then Allison will take them and scale them up to seven feet and then they will be cast in bronze. The east is the beginning of life, the west is youth, the south is adulthood, and the north is elderly. Our sculpture has seven trees connected to the leaf canopy of the main structural base. Seven is a significant number in Native American culture because of the inclusion of the four directions representing equality and three that represents Father Sky, Mother Earth, and the spirit that is within us that connects us and makes us all related in the circle of life. These trees are not only placed strategically for the structural integrity of the sculpture, they also support the Native American conceptual idea of always preparing for the next seven generations. So we wanted the piece to be of a large scale because it's a big open space and you really need a, a significant work of art. Not just architecture, but art. And it has to read from a distance and then pull people in. But once they're there, it has to feel welcoming and safe. The sculpture is its whole environment. I think it's an amazing opportunity to have Addison, Deborah, John, be able to express their knowledge of the region through their art in that particular place. I want to honor everyone who was a part of this. You know, the native peoples, and I'm trying to go in order of time. The native peoples, Roger Williams, the enslaved, the Cape Verdean, all the immigrant and all the laborers, to try and turn that in to something in, with both words and and form, and then also honor nature. It's like very, very wonderful and ambitious. I'm really excited to be a part of it. It's really cool. So it's really important. We have a team of artists collaborating with a team of architects. And it's very important that the work grows out of an artist, a sculptor's lens. Deb and I are diehard in the trenches, sculptors and art and painters. We are now looking at it and making that final sense of the boulder and the scale and visualizing it through a sculptor's lens. Aoutash Wampanoag Aoutash Narragansett Aoutash Nipmuc Aoutash Tequah